Hi, I'm Nick Patience, the AI Platform's Practice Lead at Futurum, and we're here at AWS reInvent in Las Vegas, and I'm joined by um, Sam Pearson, the CTO of Click, and Brendan Grady, the GM of AI and Analytics at Click. Welcome. Thanks great. for having us. Yeah, great to be here. So we're going to talk about, um, obviously, data and CIOs and cost and resiliency and all these kind of things. But Sam, let's, let's start with you. What, what are CIOs um, most concerned with at the moment? Yeah, I think, look, the, today there's so much pressure uh, from, from the AI front. You've got boards, you've got the executive teams who are basically saying, hey, we like this is something we have to embrace one way or the other. And I think the, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems is that we've got still these, all these treasure troves of data that are stored within these enterprises. And you know, from, a, from extracting that data and getting it ready for AI, not much of that has actually changed, but there's so many additional rules and regulations now. You've got different regulations in the, in the US, you've got regulations all over Europe, uh, talking about uh, residency, uh, the, the regulation around data, how it can be used and everything. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of just general change and sort of this fear of getting locked into one pattern when six months from now, like it is of course gonna change. And so I think one of the things that we hear a lot is just like, hey, how do you help me be more flexible in my data strategy, the architectures that we're building out? It's a, it's a huge concern for folks. So they're concerned about vendor lock-in, they're concerned about data platforms lock-in. Um, so how, do, how, does, how does Click kind of um, help with that situation? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that we've done, I guess, from, from first principles is just try to help our customers get choice, right? So you may have, um, you may have different workloads. You're going to have things that are maybe more operational. As you start to pick up these different AI workloads, you are going to have all sorts of different vendors that you're going to want to work with, right? You might want to put it in Snowflake. You might want to put it in Databricks. You might need to feed it into a model. And uh, one of the things that, that we have done within our data platform is the ability to basically bring it into this, this data substrate that can then be reused, right? And like we can very quickly add new targets, we can add different patterns. Um, so that's, that's sort of it in a nutshell. I would also say uh, some of the things that we've seen also around the Open Lake House are, are a, it's a huge trend this year that we, uh, that we have picked up on. Um, the ability to not just have scale or performance or you know optimize for cost, but really to be able to manage between all three of those with you know your variety of, of workloads. Uh, and so the ability, like for us, to be able to store that data, potentially store it in multiple different places or have different data sets that are stored in different areas, but then still have your engine come in and read those, query those. All of the all of those things are patterns that we have that we've helped our users get set up. Cool. Um, Brendan, to turn to you. So um, let's think about how organizations need the flexibility to plug in new AI capabilities, um, you know, over and over. Yeah, as this thing evolves, this is, you know, the kind of compression of time we're getting, we're, we're dealing with now as to, you know, how fast innovation is coming is just incredible. And and so, you know, the, the, what, what um, Scott was talking about, about the, about the data pipelines, what do you see, um, you know, chief data officers maybe and the people who work with them? Um, you know, how do, how do they kind of, um, you know, what do they need to do um, in order, in order to get that flexibility and portability of data for that kind of ever-changing AI landscape. That's really, it's it's a really hugely val valuable point right now. I mean, Sam said the, said the word six months came out of his mouth, and I sort of chuckled um, because the reality is you're getting new capabilities coming in every couple of weeks. So the way what we're hearing out of of chief data officers, CIOs, and actually more and more chief risk officers are starting to think about this as well, right? Because there's inherent risk. What we're hearing from them is number one they need to make sure that their data foundation is in order because the majority of problems that they're starting to see where they're seeing failures in some of their initiatives is because their data quality wasn't where it needed to be. So they need to really think about this trusted data product. So we're hearing some of that. Um, the other thing we're hearing is once you get the trusted data foundation in place, there are so many different models out there and they seem to be changing constantly. So giving our customers the flexibility to evolve with us and bring their type, the types of models they want to work with is another, we, uh, another area we really are focused in on. We're also seeing more openness. And one of the things that we're trying to address is to say, look, we want to be an open ecosystem to provide access to some of the core capabilities around trusted data and our analytics engine and AI engine that will really surface context in a trusted intelligence layer. 
these are some things that are keeping like a chief risk officer up at night. So I think you're going to see the chief risk officer and CDO spend a lot more time together, especially with AI. Are you talking about semantic kind of layer there? That's a good point. Semantic layers, that's one piece of the puzzle, right? So when it comes to making sure that you can make the best, most accurate decisions using any type of AI technique, it comes down to having the semantic layer, but more importantly, it comes down to trusted context in all of that. And that is gonna require more than just a semantic layer. Yes, semantics. Uh, you'll also need to make sure that the data products and trusted data that you're bringing in is all of the data you need. And then you'll need to apply techniques to it to make sure that you actually get the context of why an agent may or may not be acting on your behalf. Hugely critical. Mm. Well, you mentioned the word agent. Um, so I, I just, it just struck me, obviously, we've gone in the last three years from, you know, generative AI to agentic, they're obviously one's built on top of the other, they're not, they're not separate things, but maybe you can talk about um, the challenges that agentic AI, we're obviously very early, but the challenges that it looks like it might present to organizations from a kind of data point of view. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at, if you look at the way that the foundational models have been built, right, it's trained on the open internet, these things are absolutely phenomenal for general purpose question and answer, right? But for the enterprise, the key is like, how do you get your data into that model, or how do you how do you get your proprietary data to sort of you know get unlocked with you know with a lot of that that work that's been done? Some of the things that we're that we're seeing and that we're predicting is actually like you, and you also go back to like the reg architecture, which is also very like monolithic, you know, big blocks. I think what we're going to see now is that the agents are actually going to get much, much smaller in the jobs that they are that they are written to do. So think of it as analogous to the microservice, right? So you have these services that are that are custom for a very small context. You're gonna have the exact same thing with the agents. And then you will have corresponding data products that will get mapped into the job that that agent has to do. And when you have it in a data product then that is managed, governed, regulated, you've got an audit trail on who's accessing that or what agent is accessing that. I think that's that's sort of the pattern that that we see. Uh, because also when the, when these things are are bounded in context, it's a lot easier to have a and the evals perform well as you, you know, as you start to benchmark this across different use cases. Can I actually add something there? Yeah. Because it yeah. reminded me of sort of the first question around the CIO is what challenges are CIOs facing? They're facing the challenge of the credit card swipe. Anybody can go out and sign up for one of these agentic tools today, right? And are they going to be able to do it in a trusted, governed way? Or is it going to be the Wild West? And I think you're, you're, starting, you're starting to see this. We're in that classic pendulum of technology right now, which is heavily on IT or heavily on business. You're starting to see that swing back. So the CIO is really going to have to really think about being that business enabler again. I, then 20 years later, I'm saying it again, but that's really what we're starting to see because we look at our own company, right? Mm -hmm. We've got a bunch of different tools. Some people started on their own, right? We do have a corporate standard, but I think regulating that and then thinking about data sovereignty and data residency, that's going to be another key thing that um, you're going to have to protect your companies and it's going to expose yourself to a lot of risk. Mm. Well, let's talk about sovereignty a little bit and, and residency. How how realistic is it for for organizations that are multinational, um, especially ones obviously have operations in the EU, but really I've just noticed it's, it's basically every country in the world now. It used to be an EU-specific thing, but it's really everybody. How how realistic is it for them to achieve um, you know, true data sovereignty, um, you know, in, in, if they're spread, you know, right around, you know, around the, there's like, spread around the world. And I think there's a technology play here and there's also yeah. sort of a geopolitical play here as well. Um, I think realistically, they're not going to be given a choice, right? I think that's part of some of the challenges that every organization is going to face, whether it's the EU AI Act, whether it's what we've come out with here in the United States, there will be these acts that are going to come out that is going to mandate where, um, where you store your data, period, the end. That's not going to, that's not going to be a choice for a lot of people moving forward. From a technology perspective, you look at, let's take AWS as a great example. And one of the announcements that, that we just made uh, is we're going to take part in the EU sovereign cloud, right? We feel very, uh, very, very strongly that that is important for our customers in uh, the EU. We click, obviously, our a European company by heritage, right? We started in Sweden, and then obviously through some acquisitions, we have Israel, we have we have France as well. So I think that sovereignty is gonna be a mandate. 
Um, there's also a level of comfort, whereas there's that feeling side that's still going to come into it. People will feel uh, better about it. I mean, I'm, Sam, you're seeing some things in your team too. Yeah, and I think I think this has also driven a lot of our our strategy around where do we put our regions. So we're you know we're very we're very aware of this from a from an offering perspective. So <clears throat> being able to have regions in all of these major countries, and then not just having a presence there but also having the certifications and the compliance, the encryption, right, the monitoring, like bring your own key, all of these different features that we built into our cloud to make sure that customers feel not only like comfortable with it, but like know that if they get audited or they have to pull the logs, that it's not gonna, you know, it's gonna be fairly trivial for them to show that they're in compliance. Do you think, is, it, is this something, cause you're saying it's something they're gonna have to do. I, do you think it's, is this being customer, is this pull or push, the customer's leading this or is this, they need to get prepared for this because it's coming. No, they they absolutely need to be prepared for it. Right. Um, I don't. I mean, I haven't talked to any customers who are like, yeah, let's let's have more of this. Uh, but I think, um, look, the 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 space has moved so fast that I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the governing bodies have just felt compelled to do something, right? And whether it's you know whether it's right or wrong, uh, the, like these things are in place and there's more getting written every day. I mean, AI is the next moonshot, right? It's it's a race to the moon. Right. AI is going to be a competitive advantage, not just for businesses moving forward. Countries are going to look to AI and the data is old as this statement is. Data is the new oil. Uh, data is the new platinum is what I'm calling it, right? So it really is even more valuable than oil. It's one of those rare earth metals. And so countries are really going to want to do that. And they will drag some of their more open market constituents along with them, maybe kicking and screaming, but they will have to do it. And let's look, talk about the cost component of, of all this in terms of the avoiding lock-in portability. Yeah, what are you seeing? Obviously, CIOs are always you know focused on on that. Um, what are they sort of telling you that you know you need to you as a vendor need to do for them? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's, so. There's there's a handful of things here, right? Like like we started out. You've got companies that are under enormous pressure to expand margin, right? Like be more cost cost conscious, be fit financially. And at the same time, invest more in AI, right? And and it's like you're not going to be given a lot of time to do this. It's like, all right, you, like we need to see results of this now. I think when it comes to the um, when it comes to the data strategy, the the Lake House pattern, I think, is uh, is is one that we we've been really excited about. So the idea that you can take all of your data, and again, I think a few years back, right, it was. And you, you can go all the way back, you know, whether it was Hadoop or Oracle or any of these major vendors that have that have captured a lot of market share. We were in that position, and I think you're starting to see that that, you know, the pendulum swing back to more of a distributed model. And things like Apache Iceberg, where they 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 decouple the storage, the compute, and the metadata, really have opened the door. So now things like uh, AWS S3 tables. You can store that data in a very low cost, very you know, very commodity storage type of model. But then also, it's like, okay, well, I need Snowflake or I need Databricks to read that. Like, we're able to integrate with their catalog. They're able to point their engine at that data, do the querying, do the processing, and um, and then other things are just around like optimization, right? So, okay, are we are we pumping? Does it, do we need to pump this much data in? Do we need to hit the compute bill for these different vendors? Or can we like we can we meter that back and still meet the SLA that we have committed to inside inside the business? So um, lots of different patterns that have emerged around this, but that's one that we you know we see a lot of traction around. The other interesting thing, Sam, as we think about that, that we're all seeing is some of those things are diametrically opposed, right? So if you it's it's well, I can't incur incur too much data costs on this, but I don't have all the data I need to actually have the agents be trained in the right way. The agents will get things wrong. So I think you're starting, it, the, the CIOs are going to have to wrestle th with that. It is, it is no longer, oh, I just need to stand up a server in my data center. It's all of these geopolitical aspects combined with the technological, combined with business and the pressures that a lot of these CIOs feel from their boards. It is a really difficult position to be in. And we at Click feel really strongly that we want to help those CIOs to be able to navigate it regardless of which other vendors they use. That's what we're really trying to focus on. Great. Well, that's a lot. We've covered a lot of ground. That's all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you for joining us from 6.5 on the road here in, in Las Vegas, and we'll see you again next time.